One of the pillars of new atheism is that religions like Christianity are evil, detrimental for society, and need to go away for the benefit of humanity. However, for some reason, I never see any data to back this up. <laughs> well, I don't know where you've been looking, but we've got plenty of examples of Christians acting like shit stains. So let's do this. <laughs> Greetings, fellow space travelers. Bionic Dance here. And yeah, it's this guy again. He seems to think that Christianity is just the best thing ever, and no Christian has ever misbehaved. Have a look. I just keep hearing this claim like it is a fact, when actually, the data suggests otherwise. Not only does scientific research suggest that Christianity is beneficial for individuals and societies, but there is also the research that shows Christianity has helped to build the world we live in today. I see. So Christian persecution of gays hasn't been detrimental. The religious objections to evolution or climate change aren't ever going to bite us in the ass. The Crusades and the Inquisition were basically just frat parties that got out of hand. Religion was never used as a justification for racism. Non-Christians in the military don't get treated like pariahs, and nobody has ever insisted that the United States is a Christian nation, and anybody who doesn't agree should get out. None of those have ever happened, right? The first we need to address is the fact that there have been those who claim to be followers of Christ who have committed very evil and terrible acts in claiming to do so for the benefit of Christ and his kingdom. Claimed to be followers of Christ? Claimed to be doing it for his benefit and the benefit of his kingdom? Wait a second. This needs to be addressed and condemned for what it is, evil people committing evil acts. But the mistake of new atheists is to attribute the cause of this evil to Christianity. Except that it can be attributed to Christianity, as many of the off-quoted Bible verse will tell us. For example, Leviticus 20.13, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Religious homophobia can't possibly have originated there, right? Or how about Psalm 14.1, to the choir master of David, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. Couldn't possibly have contributed to the mistrust of atheists. Or how about Psalm 9.12? When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. I'm sure that one's never been abused. Or you've got Exodus 22.20, 20, He that sacrificeth to any god, save unto the Lord only, he shall be destroyed. Numbers 25.4, The Lord said to Moses, Take all the chiefs of the people and impale them in the sun before the Lord, in order that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. Or Deuteronomy 17.20, But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name, a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. These were never used to justify the Inquisition or the Crusades. Perish the thought. Or, you know, maybe Christianity isn't as fluffy bunny as you'd like us to think. Maybe. This would be the same as if I said atheism was the only thing which caused Stalin and Mao to become murdering savage dictators. Shouldn't we look at all the factors that turned them to evil instead of just saying their belief about God made them murder millions of people? Of course we should, but atheism doesn't have anything to it besides not believing in a God. There are no commandments we're expected to follow. Christianity, on the other hand, does have a book. This is a religious instruction manual, and it has some nasty things in here about what you're supposed to do to heretics and non-believers, people who don't follow the religion. So, when you tell us to look at all factors, well, this gives us a pretty good clue as to where some Christian naughtiness came from. This whole argument breaks down when we note that Jesus taught love and peace instead of war and torture. It was Soren Kierkegaard that noted that Christendom's violence was not Christian, for the very simple reason that it was dramatically opposed to what Christ taught. Jesus taught to turn the other cheek, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you. I see. So because they didn't do Christianity your way, they weren't really Christians. Have you heard of the no true Scotsman fallacy? Person A says, no Scotsman will put sugar in his porridge. Person B says, I'm Scottish and I put sugar in my porridge. 
Person A replies, well, no true Scotsman puts sugar in his porridge. You say that no true Christian would commit these atrocities because Jesus preached love and understanding? Well, he also said a few other things, too. Matthew ten twenty one, And brother shall deliver up brother unto death, and the father his child, and children shall rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Matthew ten thirty four. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. Luke twelve forty nine. I came to cast fire upon the earth. So maybe you're not the true Christian if you're ignoring these inconvenient parts of the Bible. Or maybe Christianity is such a confused and self-contradictory jumble that all it really takes to be a Christian is belief and a superficial adherence to some of the more prominent ideals of the religion. Either way, it seems more than justifiable to blame your religion for the atrocities done in its name. Any person who claims to follow Christ, yet wages war in his name, is clearly not following his teachings, but a twisted, distorted view of Christianity, completely opposite of what it is supposed to be. If that is the case, then those who claim to be killing in the name of Christ could not have gotten it from the teachings of Christ. Sounds to me like somebody's cherry-picking the parts of the Bible they like. Now, ironically, secular critics of Christianity are using Christian-based morals to denounce it. The historian C. John Somerville argues in his book that the moral views prior to the advent of Christianity was far different than what modern people have today, and that Christianity is responsible for shaping our moral views in the West. Even if that's true, even if the entire world had these wretched values, which it didn't, and it's disputable that everyone's values even were that bad, giving Christianity the credit for other people treating each other better, assuming it even is better, is more than a little presumptuous. So Somerville would ask his students, if you see an old lady with a purse, why is it wrong to take it from her? The answer for the Anglo-Saxons and other honor-based cultures would be if you pick on the weak, you will be despised, because no one will respect you if you do not respect yourself, which is clearly a self-centered ethic. However, among his students, the answer for not stealing the purse was that it was wrong because it would cause harm and turmoil to the lady. And both sides are wrong, or at least partially right, while still being wrong. Yes, it would cause turmoil and harm to the lady to take her purse. So what? Why is that a bad thing causing harm? Why would we think so? The reason? Empathy. We know how we'd feel if it happened to us, how much we wouldn't like it. But it wouldn't happen to us, so why not go ahead and do it? Because it would taint our honor. Other people would despise us for it. And there is yet another factor. If we're allowed to cause turmoil and harm to others, what's to stop them from doing it to us? That is where morality comes from. Empathy works on our conscience, public opinion works on our vanity, and knowing others can give as good as they get works on our self-preservation. That is where we get our moral code, a mutual unspoken agreement, or sometimes written into law, that makes provisions for mutually assured protections. No religion required. Somerville argues Christianity changed our ethical views away from honor-based ideas, where pride was valued, to societies that valued humility, peace, service to others, and loving your neighbor. So if you think it'd be more ethical to care for your neighbor than your own honor, then you have Christianity to thank for playing a role in shaping that. What we have here is a classic argument from authority fallacy. It goes like this. Somebody knows something about a certain topic. The historian C. John Somerville then says something about that topic. Somerville argues Christianity changed our ethical views. Therefore, that person's assertion about that subject is probably correct. So if you think it'd be more ethical to care for your neighbor than your own honor, then you have Christianity to thank for playing a role in shaping that. But just because Spanky Boy Historian says so, that doesn't make it true. And frankly, I'm glad that my morals aren't based largely on Christianity. After all, there are some moral lessons in this book that are positively repugnant. But Christianity is also argued to have given rise to science in the Western world by several historians. They readily point out ancient pagans believed the world was imbued with supernatural mysteries, natural gods, fates, fairies, and other mystical beings. Whereas those who held the Judeo-Christian values didn't view the world this way. For them, the world was a work of cosmic engineering. The sun wasn't a god, but a lamp that followed the laws of the Creator. Yeah, because that's so much better, and so much more scientific. The animals were not to be worshipped, but were under the stewardship of man. My god taught me humility. Oh yeah, and I'm your uncontested master. I'm the golden master. The spread of Judeo-Christian values disenchanted the world and gave it a scientific view.
for Christians, it followed natural laws because it was set up by a lawgiver. On what plane of existence is created deliberately synonymous with natural? And how is this science and not sorcery, thaumaturgy, divine magic? Just about every major branch of science that has been created was originated by people who believe in the Bible. They believe that they were, in the words of Johannes Kepler, thinking God's thoughts after him. So let me see if I understand this basic premise. Nobody could ever have studied the natural world scientifically without the magical, universe-creating, God-believing religion of Christianity. And it doesn't matter that the more we study the natural world, the more we realize that a God is superfluous to its existence and function. We owe all credit to science for Christianity. Makes perfect sense. E.O. Wilson asked the question, why didn't science rise in China, which had far more technology than Europe? Technology doesn't grow out of science? He concluded, of probably even greater importance, Chinese scholars abandoned the idea of a supreme being with personal and creative properties. No rational author of nature existed in their universe. Consequently, the objects they meticulously described did not follow universal principles, but instead operated within particular rules followed by those entities in the cosmic order. In the absence of a compelling need for the notion of general laws, thoughts in the mind of God, so to speak, little or no research was made for them. None of this is even slightly true. In fact, if you were to look up the history of science and technology in China on Wikipedia, what you'll find is that ancient Chinese scientists, mathematicians, and doctors made significant advances in science, technology, mathematics, and astronomy. Traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture, and herbal medicine were also developed through empirical observation and scientific experimentation. Among the earliest inventions were the abacus, the shadow clock, and the first items such as Kunming lanterns. The four great inventions, the compass, gunpowder, paper making, and printing, were among the most important technological advances, only known in Europe by the end of the Middle Ages, 1,000 years later. So when you say that the Chinese had no science that was based on natural laws, you're full of shit. And I have barely scratched the surface. Christianity helped increase literacy. Christians have brought literacy to hundreds of millions of people of all sorts of languages by codifying those languages in the first place. Okay, so Christianity may have done one good thing, but that hardly excuses the rest of the shit humanity has been put through in its name. Further, there is no evidence to suggest the rise in literacy required Christianity, that it could not have risen by other means. All in all, humanity didn't exactly come out ahead on this deal. There are hundreds of languages that were first set to writing by Christian missionaries in order to translate the Bible into their own tongue. So teaching people to read wasn't exactly an act of kindness. They had ulterior motives, spreading their religion to other people, like it or not. Yep, you definitely got my respect. So the idea Christianity has been detrimental is an unfounded fairy tale. What we have here is shameless cherry-picking coupled with weapons-grade confirmation bias. The only way that it can be said that Christianity has not been detrimental is if we ignore all of the inconvenient parts of history. But couldn't one turn the attention to the present? Perhaps one could argue that religion is detrimental for society now and preventing civilization from moving forward. But scientific research also shows the opposite of this idea. Dozens upon dozens of studies show that religion is extremely beneficial and promotes ethical behavior in several different ways. So rampant homophobia, denial of women's rights over their own bodies, refusing to accept inconvenient science like climate change and evolution, and shoving God in everyone's faces, that's Christians being oh so ethical and moral, eh? They also showed a meta-analytical review that married religious adults are more likely to stay married. I seem to recall something about Christians considering divorce a sin. I wonder how many of those marriages were happy ones. A meta analytical review that agreeableness and conscientiousness correlates with religiousness. Agreeableness and conscientiousness? What does that even mean? By whose standards? Does agreeable mean you'll just let people run roughshod over you without standing up for yourself? Or does it just mean that you're friendly? And there are a lot of Christian ideas and ideals about what it means to be conscientious with which non-Christians disagree. Whose values are we using to make that determination? I'm not sure we can trust any of these conclusions without defining a few terms first. That religion is tied to decreased levels of psychoticism. Which, you know, explains all those Christians going around shooting abortion doctors. 
Religiousness was strongly positively associated with being respectful, helpful, reasonable, polite, self-disciplined, honoring elders, and enjoying life. You know, quite frankly, I'm not willing to trust this study he keeps citing, because even from the introductory paragraph, it sure sounds like its authors have some preconceived notions. For example, they say, using Carver and Shire's 1998 theory of self-regulation as a framework for organizing the empirical research, the authors review evidence relative to six propositions, A, that religion can promote self-control, B, that religion influences how goals are selected, pursued, and organized, C, C, that religion facilitates self-monitoring, D, that religion fosters development of self-regulatory strength, E, that religion prescribes and fosters proficiency in a suite of self-regulatory behaviors, and F, that some of religion's influences on health, well-being, and social behavior may result from religion's influences on self-control and self-regulation. The authors conclude with suggestions for future research. And it goes on to say, religion is a potent force. History testifies to religion's ability to focus and coordinate human effort, to create awe and terror, to foster war and peace, to unify social groups, and to galvanize them against each other. In addition to religion's social power, however, religion is a psychological force that can influence the outcomes of individual human lives. Indeed, the range of health-related behavioral and social outcomes with which religiousness is associated is both provocative and puzzling. In other words, it sure sounds like they think religion is the best thing ever, and let's go examine how cool it is. Now, I could be wrong, but I'm sorry, this sounds really, really biased, and I'm calling shenanigans. I am practically just rambling on now. It is no wonder psychiatrist Andrew Sims says, Still more arguments from authority. If the findings of a huge volume of research on this topic had gone in the opposite direction and it had been found that religion damages your mental health, it would have been front page news in every newspaper in the land. In other words, we're Christians and everyone keeps picking on us. You know, your religion only needed one martyr. So it dumbfounds me that new atheists can claim Christianity is detrimental and evil. Well, maybe if you weren't looking at Christianity through lenses that filter out all the horrors done in its name, or denying that they were done by Christians, you might start to understand. Okay, maybe Christianity has done some good in the world, but it's also hurt a lot of people, and in the balance, the atrocities outweigh the benefits. The only conclusion that I can come to about new atheists that claim this is that they are ignorant of the science and didn't bother to check, or they are misleading people on purpose to further their anti-religion agenda. I see. So the choices are either ignorance or some sort of bigoted conspiracy? I don't fucking think so. I have seen religion mistreat far too many people. I have seen far too many people who've left religion talk about how much more free they feel, how much better their lives are without religion. I've had far too many of my subscribers tell me the same thing, some of them even thanking me personally for helping them get out of what they saw as a stifling, oppressive, restrictive force in their lives. Much as it pains me to say this, but... Fuck the science. It doesn't match what I see in the real world. I see religion causing pain and misery to too many people to even think for a moment that it's a good thing. From denying climate change and evolution, to parents disowning gay children, to killing doctors, to biblical misogyny, to those pastors who can't keep their hands off the altar boys, Christianity is not a pleasant force in this world. And your video doesn't even mention these things. It doesn't even skirt around them. It just acts as if they don't happen at all. Between that and the seemingly biased study you cite, you'll have to forgive me if I don't accept your premise or your assessment of atheist reasons for finding Christianity to not be quite so happy happy. Scientist Michael Bloom published a study called The Reproductive Benefits of Religious Affiliation, where he points out evolution favors religiousness so strongly for its increasing procreation effects that over time, religion has become embedded in our genes. Religion is genetic? So religions like Christianity are not going anywhere, and neither are the enormous benefits they have brought. Thank God. Well, we'll see about that. Until next time, fellow space travelers, this is Bionic Dance saying don't run on automatic. Instead, please think.